is from Wallops, and this is the first Minotaur Peacekeeper base launched uh, from, from Wallops, and also our first lunar mission as well. Well, let's look at the countdown now. What uh, is going on right now at this point? Well, right now in, in, in the countdown, we're in the final arming and, and uh, 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 clearing, final arming of the launch vehicle. So we're, we're putting in the final, uh, uh, removing, I should say, the, the final inhibits for the launch vehicle such that it's ready for launch. And we're clearing the pad, making sure it's safe. Uh, uh, once we do that, there won't be any personnel out there. Uh, the uh, um, once we do that, then we'll go into the actual final countdown, uh, final countdown checklist, beginning at a seven min 70 minutes out from uh, T zero. Well, looking back at earlier this afternoon and maybe some this evening, when did the countdown start, and what are the main things that have already occurred? In the sure, countdown? absolutely. Uh, the the first uh, the countdown actually began eight hours uh, prior to T to, to zero, which is 11:50 or 11:27 uh, this evening, uh, east east coast time. And uh, the, the first uh, setup was really with the range. The range has a tremendous amount of responsibility that they have to go through. And so that's, uh, they're the first to be on station and really begin uh, some heavy work. Uh, the rest of the crew, the spacecraft, including the, the uh, operations center back east, uh, uh, came on station at about five hours and 30 minutes uh, before T-0. And uh, the first thing we did is a, a, a bunch of, you know, we do a, establish our comm checks and, and the, uh, the, the next step is really to establish communications with the vehicle, the launch vehicle, with the downrange assets, the C-band raiders, and as well as checking out our, uh, our, our TDRS and data relay uh, satellite system links. Uh, we've already checked out the entire um, launch vehicle internal electronics and avionics and, uh, and, and the space vehicle is doing, doing very well. And uh, we rolled the tower uh, which was a major event, uh, removed it, uh, the, the mobile access tower, and uh, uh, at, at four hours and, and 30 minutes uh, from T0. And uh, at this point, what's going to happen moving forward once we clear the pad is we're going to redo all those same checks that we did earlier, the communications checks, the avionics checks, the, the navigation checks. And uh, at about uh, T minus 12 is when it gets really interesting. And that's when we actually uh, uh, load the flight computer with the launch time and begin our auto, auto sequence uh, uh, set, set of steps. Now, I know you monitored the weather briefing, uh, which was about a half hour ago. Can you tell us a little bit about what was in that and what we can look forward to at T-Zero? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the uh, uh, Much better than our actual dress rehearsal, we actually have a, a very clean uh, and green weather right now. It's uh, it's actually fantastic for, for a, a good good night for a launch. Well, thank you, Colonel Gillespie, and uh, we're looking forward to the uh, remainder of the countdown, and thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Here. We're at uh, T-minus one hour, 51 minutes, and counting. This is Minotaur Launch Control.
This is Minotaur Launch Control at T-minus 1 hour, 46 minutes, 31 seconds and counting. We're joined now by Keith Kohler, who is based here at the Wallops Flight Facility and is joining us as our LADEE mission commentator. Wallops is less well known for some of our, as some of our other NASA launch sites are, but Wallops has been here doing launches for quite a long time and their launches are evolving. So, Keith, Tell us something about the White's Wallops Flight Facility. Sure. Thank you, George. The first research rocket launch from Wallops Island occurred on July 4th, 1945. Since that time, Wallops has launched, had a long successful history of launching suborbital rockets and expendable launch vehicles carrying payloads for science research and technology development. With Laddie, Wallops will meet a new milestone, its first launch carrying a spacecraft beyond Earth orbit. But the Wallace Flight Facility, located on Virginia's eastern shore, and a mere four-hour drive from the nation's capital, is more than NASA's rocket launch range. It plays a vital role in NASA's suborbital research program with using sounder rockets and scientific balloons. With these vehicles, scientists and scientists and engineers in training conduct research from locations from around the world. This month, the balloon program is targeting the launch of six science missions from Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and in October, the Sunny Rocket program is at White Sands Pistol Range in New Mexico. Wallops also is a hub for NASA's airborne science research. Currently, Wallops-based aircraft are supporting Earth science research missions in Houston, and next week will begin in Greenland. The facility also is currently hosting the NASA Global Hawk unmanned aircraft based at the Dried Flight Research Center, supporting the Hurricane and Severe Storm Sentinel mission. From CubeSat development to supporting scientific research on global ice and ground validation studies for the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, projects at Wallops are diverse. In addition, the 1,200 Wallops employees support not only NASA programs, but also those with other government agencies and commercial aerospace industry, including the launch of Orbital Sciences Corporation's Antares rocket to the International Space Station coming up in just a matter of a week. Tonight's launch of the U.S. Air Force Minotaur V with the NASA LADY spacecraft is not only adding to the history of Wallops, but also is highlighting the capabilities of the facility. We look forward to supporting this historic mission. Well, thank you, Keith. And uh, indeed, the role of uh, Wallops is growing as a major NASA launch site, particularly here on the East Coast. So we'll look forward to hearing a little bit more uh, about Wallops here in just a, uh, just a few moments. Uh, meanwhile, our countdown is continuing to go smoothly. The uh, forecast showing still, as uh, we went into this, uh, still just a 5% chance of not uh, meeting our launch weather criteria today. At uh, launch time, we're expecting a uh, temperature of about 71 degrees with a relative humidity of 54% and easterly winds at 5 knots. Just a few clouds at 5,000 feet and scattered clouds at 25,000 feet. So uh, as uh, we've had for the last couple of days, a very favorable forecast that looks like it's going to hold right up until launch time. At T-minus, one hour, 43 minutes, 17 seconds, and counting, this is Metatar Launch Control.
And welcome back. We're now joined with Dale Nash, the Executive Director of the Virginia Commercial Space Flight Authority and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. And Dale, uh, obviously the Mars uh, Spaceport pad has a huge uh, part of this uh, mission. Can you explain what Mar is Mars and what's its role in this mission? Well, certainly it uh, is the uh, very short runway where this rocket takes off at. But Mars itself... Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport came about as part of uh, the, the nation's and, and NASA's uh, uh, Commercial Space Act, which encouraged states to uh, to get into the uh, space business. And Virginia, with uh, Wallops Island here, chose to get into the space business beginning in about 1979, or ni 1997, excuse me, got, got reversed there. Uh, began to develop this launch pad 0B and it it has uh, seen a, uh, about five launches uh, we have continued to build it up and uh, it is one of two launch pads within the uh, Wallops uh, flight facility itself that is on a long-term lease to the state of Virginia uh, would, which has encouraged the state of Virginia now to put uh, well over 80 million dollars into the infrastructure here most of it in launch pad 0A for the Antares rocket, but this is a fairly significant launch pad in and of itself for uh, launch pad B. Thank you, Dale. Uh, what was the process for preparing this vehicle? When did we start to stack and get everything ready for this launch? Uh, backing up just a little bit, since this is a lot bigger rocket, uh, to, to prepare the pad in the first place, we had to increase the uh, space, uh, the concrete space on the pad by about 4,600 square feet with uh, pilings, uh, reinforced concrete to, to take a 500 ton crane, which would lift the rocket, and Type 2 transporters, uh, which the Air Force uses to transport these fairly heavy rocket motors around. We extended the gantry height to 127 feet to accommodate the taller rocket and the, and the payload. And we had to uh, make the uh, platforms bigger to, to accommodate the 92-inch diameter rocket. So that started uh, well, well over uh, 18 months ago. Uh, and then uh, we, had, we had run a pathfinder to make sure everything went fine and it did go well. But uh, the rocket motors arrived here. July 30th, um, they did some preparations uh, beginning the 31st of July, and we started to stack on the 8th of, uh, or on on the 11th of August. And in this case, we bring the segments out and stack them vertically. So on the 11th and 12th, we stack the first, second, and third stages of the uh, rocket. On the uh, 14th, we put the fourth stage up, and on the uh, 24th, we put the fifth stage up. So uh, it went together pretty fast, has gone together very smooth. Uh, the, uh, my congratulations to uh, the Mars team and certainly the Orbital team. They have done this before and, and uh, moved out quite, uh, quite swiftly on it and, and very smoothly. So, Great. So, um, so we have this launch tonight and um, really you have a pretty busy schedule uh, coming up between the two pads that you guys have uh, coming up this fall. So what's, what's on your plate coming up what, for the next few, few what's months? What's on our plate is to get this launch off tonight. We certainly hope uh, that, that all goes well and, and as you have said, the countdown is going extremely well. Great rocket, great weather, uh, uh, very capable launch pad. Uh, if we launch tonight, we follow up 11 days from now with the uh, COTS Orb D1 mission to uh, to the International Space Station. That will be the first uh, delivery of the uh, Cygnus uh, uh, cargo vehicle to the International Space Station. Then on November 4th, we will follow up with uh, an ORS-3 mission, a Minotaur one, a Minuteman derivative, where this is an MX derivative rocket. Uh, and then in mid-December, uh, we will deliver cargo again to the International Space Station with the Antares and on the uh, first uh, cargo resupply mission, uh, Orb D-1. So it is uh, it is very busy, and uh, it's exactly what you want. I guess it's like people who will complain they pay too much taxes. Most people want that problem. When you're in the launch business, you want to be very busy, and we're working quite a bit of overtime with our folks, but I see a lot of happy faces out there ready to get this one off and, and move on to the next one. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Dell. Glad thank you could you. join us, and good luck tonight, and hope everything Absolutely. goes well. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we're now at T minus one hour, 35 minutes, and 17 seconds uh, for the launch of the Laddie spacecraft on the Air Force Minotaur 5. This is Wallace Launch Control. In all stations, this is the launch conductor on the primary countdown net. In approximately five minutes, we'll conduct a weather brief, and that will close out the Laddie Minotaur 5 final arming and vehicle closeout checklist. We'll perform that weather brief at approximately T minus one hour and 30 minutes. LC out.
with the launch conductor on the primary content net. At this time, we'll perform step number 16, page 39 of the Minotaur 5 final arming and vehicle closeout checklist. Elwo, conduct a weather brief on the weather net. Elwo, well, moving to the weather net. Okay, all stations on the weather net channel 4, this is the project manager. All stations acknowledge when polled. Elwo? Elwo, we are. RSO? RSO. LC? LC. MD? MD. And TD? TD. Elwo, please proceed with the weather briefing. CLWO with a T minus 130 weather update. Currently, we have high pressure still building into the region. Nothing significant as far as any precipitation or cloudiness near us. On nothing significant on the radar, nearest precipitation echoes well off the South Carolina coastal region, nothing near Coquina and nothing near us. That's all anomalous propagation you see on the radar depiction right now. Current conditions of wallops, they'll have scattered at 5,500 feet, scattered 25,000, visibility unrestricted, easterly winds at 5 knots, temperature is running 70 degrees Fahrenheit, humidity 54%. Burkina still has the same general conditions, scattered at 5,000 feet, visibility unrestricted, a little breezier down there with a east northeasterly wind gusting 18 knots, temperature 73 degrees. Bermuda also looking green, good conditions there. Our latest T minus 3.5. Winds show the low levels of the atmosphere. We have uh, still a northwesterly uh, wind once you get off the surface, and the strongest wind running about 26 knots in the lower levels of the atmosphere. The strongest wind all the way up to 100,000 feet is 44 knots at 100,000. Launch forecast for Wallops Island, still looking for very good conditions. A few clouds at 5,000 feet, visibility unrestricted. Winds out of an easterly or east southeasterly component at about four knots. They're becoming very light. May shift a little bit more to the easterly direction in time here if they continue to be this light or two to four knots or so as we approach launch time. You may see a slightly more easterly component. Temperature looking for about 66 degrees, a little bit of an increase in what we briefed earlier, and humidity 67. Coquina is also looking good, breezy conditions for launch, but no weather down there. And Bermuda looking good also. Forecast winds showing a max wind of 30 knots, only at 35,000 feet. Very, very light winds all the way up in the atmosphere. Probability of violation still leaving at 5% for any onshore flow, any low cloud ceilings we may have in the area. Nothing evident on the satellite picture. Every, everything's looking very good for launch, so total probability of violation only running 5%. That concludes my weather briefing. All stations, this is the launch conductor and primary content net. Check step 16, a weather briefing was conducted. This completes the Laddie Minotaur 5 final arming and vehicle closeout checklist. We are holding no steps open. The LV and SV team are working no issues at this time. We will begin the Laddie Minotaur 5 final launch checklist at T minus 70 minutes. LCM. One hour, 25 minutes. This is Benatar Launch Control at T minus one hour, 25 minutes, 24 seconds, and counting. Joining us now is Ron Graby, the Executive Vice President and General Manager of Orbital Sciences Launch Systems Group. 
And uh, Ron, we've just come from a very successful launch at Vandenberg Air Force Base of NASA's IRIS Observatory on an Orbital Sciences Pegasus XR rocket. And now we're here tonight at Wallops Island on the uh, East Coast with Orbital conducting the countdown operations for the Minotaur 5. So um, with, with another one uh, coming up even just a couple of more weeks from now, Orbital is maintaining a, a dual launch capability for both the um, West Coast and the East Coast? Hey, yes, we are, George, and certainly it seems like uh, it was just days or weeks ago that we were at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base for the IRIS launch. I guess in reality it was back at the end of June, but seems much uh, closer than that. Uh, Orbital maintains a variety of launch uh, programs for space lift, and we are capable of launching from both coasts here at uh, Wallops uh, Vandenberg on the West Coast, uh, Kodiak Island up in Alaska, and also Kwajalein Atoll in the South Pacific. Well, after the Minotaur 5 lifts off from the pad, uh, let's look at some animation now and tell us what the flight's going to look like. You've uh, got another vehicle almost after this one, but here's our animation. If you okay. can tell us what's Well, the Minotaur 5 is a five-stage vehicle. Uh, all five stages are solid rocket motors. Uh, the first three stages are actually retired ICBM assets. Here we are lifting off the pad. Stage 1 is the first stage of a Peacekeeper ICBM. Um, the stage one, obviously, we're flying through the uh, through the atmosphere, and uh, tipping over and uh, and heading on downrange. So at this point, uh, we're being tracked by uh, radars here out at uh, Wallops and uh, uh, down the coast as a burnout of the first stage, first stage separation. The second stage picks up. Second stage is also a, a, a Peacekeeper ICBM retired motor. All of these solid rocket motors burn for somewhere in the duration of 60 to 90 seconds. That seems to be a, a rule for solid rocket motors. There's burnout of the second stage. And third stage ignition. There's payload fairing separation. That's a big event for us. We're now really out of the sensible atmosphere. Stage three burnout uh, is, follows, uh, is followed by a, a significant coast of about four minutes. Uh, at that point, uh, our communications uh, really switches over to Tedris. There's stage three separation. Stage 4 ignition. Stage 4 is a commercial motor provided by ATK. Stage 4 burnout uh, is followed by a longer coast, about a 10 minute, uh, minute coast. And uh, during that coast we actually start to spin up stage 5. This is to uh, provide stability to the stage as it burns. There's stage five ignition. And then following stage five burnout, we actually despin prior to spacecraft SEP, and that's the process you see going on there. And now coming up on payload separation, and that event will be about 23 minutes into the flight. So that uh, then puts us on the way to the moon. We've got uh, another uh, orbital rocket coming up right after this. So tell us about where we stand in getting that. Yes, we do, fly. George. That's uh, the Antares launch vehicle, and that's for what we're calling, uh, or what NASA calls, the COTS demo mission, uh, which is the trial run for delivering cargo to the International Space Station. Um, if we get off tonight, the COTS demo mission will fly uh, on the 17th of September, so we look forward to coming back and doing it again. That, of course, is going to be a much bigger rocket. Right. <laughs> well, Ron, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to uh, speaking with you again on some of the other upcoming orbital missions. Thank you uh, very my much. pleasure, George. You know, it's not every uh, night that you get to put something on its way to the moon. So That's this right. is a pretty exciting mission for all of us. We're at T-minus one hour, 20 minutes, 20 seconds. And counting, this is Minotaur Launch Control.
This is Benatar Launch Control, T minus one hour, 18 minutes, 18 seconds, and counting. Joining us now is Bob Barber, the NASA Ames Spacecraft Systems Engineer for LADI. Bob, we're glad to um, have you with us to tell us something about the spacecraft, particularly the uh, common frame, the bus part of it, and a little bit more about LADI itself and, and how we've put that together. So uh, first of all, tell us what the spacecraft bus is and how does that give you some flexibility particularly on this mission okay uh, thank you George it's great to be here um, really happy to to be speaking about the spacecraft tonight uh, yes the spacecraft bus is a uh, is a carbon composite uh, modular bus it consists of four segments uh, that we have it's a monocoque carbon fiber which is overlay the carbon fiber overlays a honeycomb uh, core um, you can stack this when you see when we go into the video we'll see that uh, you can stack uh, the modules and we stack ours four high um, here we have a video of some of the integration activities at Ames Research Center uh, this carbon composite uh, carbon common bus was designed by the Ames team uh, you can see in this video kind of the lower two segments of it as they're uh, right now installing a science instrument um, we have two basic segments. One is kind of the rectangular bus that's the bottom three segments, and then the top is a trapezoidal bus. And this modular design allows us to uh, stack it and make different configurations for future missions. Uh, and going on with this uh, video, as I stated there, uh, right now they're uh, installing a science instrument. As you fade away here, you'll be able to see more of the entire bus structure where you see the four different segments from top to bottom of, uh, of the spacecraft. What are the different red things that we see on it? Uh, the red items that you see, the bright red items, are non-flight hardware items. Uh, we label, flag them as red so we know to take those off before we uh, commit to launch and we take those off before we close out the fairing and then commit to the launch criteria. Uh, right now, the team is uh, tightening bolts on the GSE hardware uh, for some activities that are, uh, will be occurring on the spacecraft. Um, here's our, an example of our tilt table. Uh, we designed at Ames uh, several mechanical uh, ground support equipment and electrical ground support equipment. Uh, this tilt table allows us to tilt the spacecraft up and down. Um, in the horizontal position, it allows us easier access for the engineers uh, performing integration. See this tilt table also allows us to rotate the spacecraft. Um, that allows us to get to each face of the spacecraft. There are eight faces around the spacecraft. Uh, in this uh, view, you can see several bagged items that have the silver bags on those. Those bags are to protect uh, the instruments from contamination. Um, these two uh, kind of carbon colored cones are, uh, are the inner baffles for our star tracker cameras. And uh, coming up now, they're actually installing the outer baffle on that star tracker camera. And the purpose of the, of the baffles is to keep out extraneous light from the star tracker so that they can see clearly the star field, which we utilize for navigation and control. And now they're just uh, kind of tightening down the final bolts on one of the star tracker baffles. Uh, moving on to the, uh, the next uh, item, we have an animation. All right. And in this animation, it's really uh, an animation of a transit from, uh, from Earth to the moon. Initially, we start out with these phasing loops and get farther and farther away from the Earth until we get into a transit trajectory to the moon. Uh, typically, we're rotating the spacecraft to keep it thermally balanced. We don't want it to get too hot, too cold. Uh, but periodically, we have to stop and freeze the spacecraft and point the antennas toward the Earth to get better tracking data. And then when we do that, we kind of flip it back and forth to make sure it doesn't get too, too hot or too cold on one side. Um, as, the, as we enter that last phasing loop or exit that fast last phasing loop, we go into the transit orbit to the moon. Um, as we go into the moon, we'll go around the moon and go on the dark side of the moon. 
as we see here we cross the terminator go around the dark side and as we come out from that side of the moon we uh, orient spacecraft so we can do a braking burn and we're required to do the braking burn to slow the spacecraft down so we can get captured by the lunar gravity um, we do that burn to get in our initial lunar orbit and then we have two additional uh, orbit burns that we do to finalize our orbit and uh, and get in our configuration so we can start commissioning uh, of the spacecraft and then also the science space. Now all, all the work that we saw uh, going on on the spacecraft was that all being done at NASA Ames prior yes, to coming uh, to Yes, all the Wallace? integration and test activities were done at NASA Ames. Uh, it was supported by engineering and integration and test teams and the payload teams from both Goddard and the Ames uh, Center. Ames led the INT effort. Um, with few exceptions, all of the testing was done at Ames, um, including the thermal vac testing, and then all the assembly activities were done at Ames. And, and just a little bit about the Goddard instrument that's on there. Uh, the Goddard in instrument is the neutral mass spectrometer that's on there, and I think Rick may be talking about that later. Uh, we also have an Ames instrument, the ultraviolet visible spectrometer, and then a last instrument called the uh, laser, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, lunar dust experiment, and then we also have the laser comm demo. That's right, on that's the uh, sort of the one I was uh, referring to, so we've got the yeah, three that's instruments. Yeah, the laser comm demo is by MIT Lincoln Labs. Right, the uh, three instruments and then the... Uh, technology the, the demo right yes. so all right well thank you very much for uh, giving some uh, insight on the spacecraft activities going on at Ames because uh, this uh, is uh, something that's unique for Ames in that the entire project has been conceived and uh, the spacecraft put together integrated tested all at uh, Ames and then shipped here to the East Coast essentially ready to launch is that that's yes, right. that's correct, and uh, I think the Laddie team is very excited to see our designed and tested uh, common bus architecture uh, come out to uh, come out to Wallops. It's our first flight, our first mission of this architecture, so we're really looking forward to that, and we're very excited to see that fly on Minotaur 5's first flight. Well, Bob, thanks very much, and I know you're looking forward to what's going to be happening here in about another. Uh, hour or so and yes. uh best of luck i know you're going to be looking forward to uh, seeing some of that data when it starts to come oh, out yes from very, the space very much looking forward to it we're now at t minus one hour 10 minutes 35 seconds and counting this is minotaur launch control In all stations, this is Launch Conductor on a primary countdown net. T minus one hour and ten minutes and counting. This is the LC with a pole for readiness to proceed with S band open loop radiation and SIGI alignment. All stations report go. VM. VM go. BLC. BLC go. PCC. PCC go. VC. VC go. FTS. FTS go. Orb TM. Orb TM go. GNC. GNC go. CE. CE go. MM. MM go. SVTD. SVTDs go. RSO. RSO go. OM. OM go. PM. PM go. All stations report go. Check step one. Step two orb T TM. Begin data recording. Recorder on. Check step two. PCC power on vehicle GN2 cooling. Vehicle GN2 cooling on. Check step three. Step four, PCC, disable ODMREs. ODMREs disabled. Check step four. And step five, PCC, apply avionics external power for the following systems. Proceeding. Avionics mock. Vehicle encoder. Booster mock. 
Siggy. Flight computer, ACS fairing PTs, stage one PTs, stage two PTs, stage three PTs, vehicle transmitter, Stage five mock. Stage five PT. Stage five telemetry transmitter. Required avionics on external power. Copy that, PCC. Check step five. Step six, OM. Verify AOS for link 40 and link 84. Proceeding. Copy that. AOS for all links. Check step six, step seven, OM, begin SBEN, open loop, signal strength verification. Proceeding. Check step seven. Step eight, PCC, apply stage five internal power on the following, for the following systems. And welcome back. We're now joined with Rick Elphick from the Ames Research Center and Laddie Project Scientist. So, uh, big night for you all tonight. Uh, Very we're big getting night. there. Very big night. So, the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, I guess when most people look at the moon, we don't realize there's an atmosphere since we look directly at the, at the, at the planet or the moon itself on the surface. So, does the moon have an atmosphere? And, and since we're looking at dust, what role does that have in the whole... Uh, there good question. Go. Good question. Yeah, we the um, the first video that I have queued up here actually illustrates one of the interesting things about the the lunar atmosphere. Uh, this is the this is meant to illustrate um, both the the tenuous tenuous very exotic lunar atmosphere uh, that is present around the moon, something you cannot see from the Earth, and also this mystery of lofted dust, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. But yes, we're taught in grade in grade school and and probably in junior high that the moon has no atmosphere. Indeed, it does have an atmosphere, but it's utterly unlike our own atmosphere. It's very tenuous and uh, basically the same uh, atmospheric pressure as you would find above the International Space Station. That's how tenuous it is. Thank you. So there are, we have um, three science instruments on board. If you could kind of Give us an idea of what those are and what are they going to be looking at. Sure thing. Uh, in fact, uh, another video that uh, is uh, available to us here uh, shows Laddie pirouetting through space. We just saw this a little while ago, but it also gives us a nice look at the instruments uh, that are aboard the, the spacecraft. Uh, the golden instrument that you're looking at, at the si on the side of the spacecraft right now is the Lunar Laser Communication System, and the box that's looking dark that's coming around on the side of the spacecraft is the Neutral Mass Spectrometer. Above it is a coffee can s shaped uh, uh, instrument called the Lunar Dust Experiment. And at the very top on the opposite side of the dust experiment is the ultraviolet invisible spectrometer. These instruments are used to address the two principal scientific questions of LADI, which are, uh, what is the lunar atmosphere as exotic and tenuous as it is? What is it made of? Uh, we already know some of the constituents that are, that are in the atmosphere, argon and helium sodium and potassium, but we suspect that there are many, many, many more. And so uh, the instruments that are aboard LADI are, are meant to, to answer that question. What are they? How do they vary? Uh, where do they come from? How are they lost? Uh, what was it like in an earlier period of history of the moon? The neutral mass spectrometer will address uh, the question of uh, gas molecules in the atmosphere, and the ultraviolet invisible spectrometer will also see emission lines coming from gases in the atmosphere. So we have two ways of going at uh, the atmospheric question. The third question, the, the third instrument, the lunar dust experiment, is actually uh, measuring dust particles that impact the instrument uh, itself and counts them one by one. And then the, the magnitude of the signal that's produced actually corresponds to the mass of the particles. So if any dust is there, uh, we will be able to measure it, see it, and characterize the density and the size of the particles involved. And that's a mystery that really goes back to Apollo. And, and Laddie is the first uh, spacecraft, the first mission, the first set of instruments that actually aim to address that question. Uh, so for the first time in 40 years, we have the opportunity to, uh, to address that mystery. So 
this is one of several missions that NASA has done over the, the last few years on looking at the mission. So what previous missions have has LADI really built on to help us understand the moon better? Uh, there's so many missions that have been there and answered uh, or raised questions because of the things that they measured. Um, actually, uh, I don't know if it's possible to jump to the, to the fourth video, but uh, uh, one of the things that, that uh, we're building on is the uh, LCROSS mission, the lunar crater uh, observing and sensing satellite, which you can see here. This mission was uh, actually directed into the south pole of the moon. They sent a, an empty Centaur rocket into a permanently shadowed crater at the south pole, and when they did so, uh, they discovered that uh, water ice was excavated uh, in uh, out of the permanently shadowed crater. Here you can see the, the Centaur impacting, setting up an injecta cloud, and for the first time in potentially billions of years, the water ice that was excavated is seeing sunlight. And then the shepherding spacecraft shown here is actually looking at the water ice signatures in uh, the infrared spectrum. Well, what has this got to do with LADI? LADI is uh, going to measure uh, components in the lunar atmosphere, and one of them we haven't seen yet, but may be there, is water. And so one of the questions is, how did the ice get to th these locations in, in the polar regions? And one mechanism for getting it there is for uh, water molecules to hop uh, from low latitudes, from the warm tropical regions of the moon, around the surface of the moon, and then up possibly some of them, some fraction of them, end up in the polar regions and get cold trapped there in the permanent shadow and in the darkness and the, and the cold. Uh, so once they stick in this very, 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 very cold region, uh, they don't get lost again. So it's a, a great way to sequester water ice. But Laddie will measure water in the atmosphere and hydroxyl OH in the atmosphere and uh, determine if indeed that is a pathway or a mechanism for getting water sequestered at the lunar poles. So it's an important uh, pathway to, to investigate and to uh, either um, uh, you know evaluate uh, uh, the 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 use the uh, the um, uh, the magnitude of the effect or whether it's really something like cometary impacts that are delivering the ice to it. Uh, so Laddie will address that and a lot of other questions about the atmosphere and dust as well. Great, Rick. Uh, so we're getting close to launch here, coming up on uh, T minus one hour. So. Good luck on the launch tonight, and then hopefully in just a couple months you'll start getting some data that will help answer some of those questions. Yes, sir. I'm really looking forward to it. We've been waiting a long time. We're really, uh, we're ready to go. We're ready okay. to go. Okay, this is uh, we're now at uh, t minus one hour and 41 seconds. We're getting close. So this is Wallops Launch Control. Test transmitter powered on. Copy that. Orb TM, check step 22. Step 23, Orb TM, evaluate power bus voltage and current. Test power nominal. Check step 23. Step 24, Orb TM, configure DCOM for TDRS playback. Configured for TDRS playback. Check step 24, step 25, VC, start TDRS test transmitter test file. Playback started. Check step 25, VM, verify AOS for link 11. Proceeding. Copy that. And all stations were currently complete through step 25, page 45 of the LADI Minotaur 5 final launch checklist, standing by step number 26. This time the LV and SV team are working no issues, and the spacecraft or the uh, range team are working no issues.
This is Minotaur Launch Control, 58 minutes, 5 seconds before the liftoff of the Minotaur 5 with Laddie. We're now inside the final hour and in the terminal countdown sequence, which begins at launch minus an hour, and we are on schedule for launch at 11.27 p.m. tonight. We're joined now by Pete Warden, the center director from the NASA Ames Research Center in Moffett Field, California. And I know this is a very significant time for NASA Ames, and it's kind of unique because there are several firsts on this mission, particularly for Ames. And I thought maybe you could tell me something about what they are and uh, some of the background about how Laddie evolved as, as a NASA Ames mission. Well, this is an uh, incredibly exciting night for uh, NASA in the U.S., and, uh, and particularly Ames, and we're very proud of it. Uh, this is the first uh, major spacecraft that has been designed, uh, uh, built, tested, and put together at the NASA Ames Research Center. Of course, it was a uh, significant teamwork across all of NASA and with industry and with the Air Force, but uh, uh, we're really proud of it. Uh, but it represents a, a new step in, uh, in building spacecraft. We used what we call a modular bus, which was a concept that was pretty unproven a few years ago. Uh, but uh, this is a low-cost mission. It's uh, typically uh, a larger mission that goes to uh, uh, the moon or Mars or another uh, place in the solar system is a uh, billion dollars or more. Uh, this mission was a few hundred million and is a significant step forward. And when I say modular bus, uh, that means that we didn't build it as a kind of an organic whole. We built pieces that are then mixed and matched. Uh, and this is much like your uh, uh, desktop computer. You know, if you need more memory, you put a different module in. If you need a better display, you put a new module in. Uh, so this design can be used to land on, uh, on the moon, uh, potentially land on Mars, uh, rendezvous with an asteroid. So it's a very general purpose design. So if we prove this out tonight, uh, uh, we think there'll be a lot of new uses of this uh, spacecraft. So we're pretty proud of, uh, proud of our new baby. Well, the, the moon is not really New. It's not a new mission for NASA Ames. You've had some some lunar experience in the past at Ames and, and some missions. Can you touch maybe on some of that? Well, yes. I mean, it's uh, uh, Ames is not a traditional spacecraft center, but we've actually done a lot uh, with the moon. In the 1990s, we had the uh, Lunar Prospector, uh, which uh, followed on to a, a military mission that was done about 10 years before called Clementine. Of course, in a previous job, I worked on Clementine, so I was uh, pretty excited to, to come back. But uh, since I've been at Ames, we've had two uh, major missions. Uh, the mission that was discussed here a little earlier, the uh, Lunar Crater Observing and Sensing Satellite, uh, proved that there was ice on the moon, that, that the previous spacecraft, such as Clementine and the Lunar Prospector, indicated was there. Uh, so this is our fourth, uh, or the fourth uh, mission that uh, I've been involved with, and the third Ames a lunar mission, and we're now in the planning stages, if everything goes well, for some uh, potentially some other missions later this decade. The uh, Spacecraft Control Center for LADEE is at NASA and Ames, and uh, from right after launch and until the end of mission, so maybe you could also touch a little bit about the Control Center at Ames and its prime function um, during the flight, and we've got a live picture here, if you can tell us maybe what we're seeing there. Well, our team at, uh, at Ames, uh, uh, once the mission is launched, they take control of the spacecraft. Of course, the science control is at the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, but the flying of the spacecraft will be done at, uh, uh, at this, uh, this uh, operations center at Ames. It's kind of exciting. We've, we're right now flying a couple other missions uh, there as well, including the, uh, a solar mission called the uh, Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph. Uh, so this has been set up as a kind of a new modern, uh, low-cost, uh, uh, very efficient uh, operation system, and we're looking forward to operating uh, LADEE. Now, one of the interesting things about LADEE is that uh, it flies pretty low over the lunar surface. It gets down to kind of the, airline, or the altitude that an airliner flies over the Earth. Uh, and because the moon's gravity is so lumpy, you basically have to fly the spacecraft. Uh, so the, this control center will be doing, uh, doing real flying. Well, Pete, thanks very much for coming by and giving us uh, some background on uh, Ames' uh, role in this mission and uh, all that has uh, contributed to this one in particular. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing it off the ground here very shortly. Thanks well, very much. Thank you. Uh, go, Laddie. Go, Minotaur. <laughs> now we're at uh, T-minus 53 minutes, 12 seconds, and counting 
This is Metatar Launch Control. LCVM. Go ahead, sir. AOS for Lake 11 verified. Copy that. Check step 26 and step 27 VM. Read back Tedris S band received signal strength. Signal strength reported from NAM is EB over N0 of 5.6. Copy that, sir. Check step 27. Step 28 or TM verify receipt of Tedris data. Tedris data received, data nominal. Check step 28, VM verify receipt of Tedris data. Tedris data received, data nominal. Check step 29, VC stop Tedris playback. Playback stopped. Check step 30, Orb TM verify LOS of data from Tedris. LOS for link 11 confirmed. Check step 31, VM verify LOS for link 11. AOS for link 11. LOS, pardon me, check that. LOS for link 11 confirmed. Copy that, VM. LOS for link 11, check step 32. Step 33, Orb TM, power off the Tedris test transmitter. Tedris test transmitter powered off. Check step 33. And all stations were currently complete through step 33, page 45 of the Laddie Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. NAMBM, we have uh, concluded. And step number 34, T minus. Approaching T minus 50 minutes, VC, verify SIGI. Initialization setup is complete per Appendix C. Initial information confirmed, setup complete. Copy that. Check step 34. Step 35, VM, verify SIGI in standby mode. Siggy in standby mode, ready to proceed. Copy that. Check step 35. Step 36. VC, command Siggy to GC Align. GC Align send on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Copy that. Check step 36. Step 37. VM, verify Siggy and GC Align. Proceeding. Copy that, sir. Siggy and GC Align. Copy that, VM. Check step 37. Step 38, VM. Confirm Siggy alignment complete. Proceeding. Copy that. Standing by. Step number 38.
This is Benatar Launch Control, T minus 47 minutes, 13 seconds and counting. Right now, the launch team is going through final checkout of the so called SIGI, that's the guidance and navigation system for the Minotaur rocket, and uh, also uh, some final checks of the flight computer. Once the rocket lifts off, the tracking of the vehicle will be on NASA's tracking antennas here at Wallops. The launch azimuth of the Minotaur 5 will be 92.7 degrees, almost exactly due east. About 23 seconds after liftoff, the Coquina tracking station, which is located on the Outer Banks just north of Kitty Hawk, will also acquire the rocket. As it continues to fly out over the Atlantic Ocean, the data coverage will come through the Bermuda tracking station at about two minutes into flight. And it will continue until the conclusion of the third stage burn, at which time the Tedris East tracking and data relay satellite will begin providing the data tracking it as it flies over the Atlantic and the coast of uh, west coast of Africa. And at that point, uh, all of our data will be coming entirely through the TDRS satellite system. After spacecraft separation from the Antares fifth stage, which occurs at about 23 and a half minutes after launch, LADI powers itself up, damps out any rotation, and then it also begins attempting to contact the ground through the tracking and data relay satellite system. Just completed the check out of the guidance system and uh, going now into the uh, final configuration for the flight computer. At T minus 45 minutes, 20 seconds and counting, this is Minotaur launch control. 42 VC select orb nav heading. Orb nav heading selected. Check step 43. Step 44 VC confirm orb nav heading set up parameters. Orb nav heading verified at 91.7629 degrees. Copy that. Check step 44. Step 45 VC select send heading command. Send heading command sent. Check step 45. Step 46 is deleted. Step 47 VC. From the flight computer tab, select get transfer alignment. Get transfer alignment selected. Check step 47. Step 48 VC. Confirm transfer alignment setup parameters. Proceeding. Copy that. Transfer alignment information confirmed. Copy that VC. Check step 48. Step 49 VC. Select send transfer alignment command. Send transfer alignment command sent. Check step 49. VM verify transfer alignment parameter values in telemetry. Proceeding. Transfer alignment information verified. Check step 50. Step 51, VM verify orb nav in standby no mode. Orb nav in standby mode, ready to proceed. Check step 51. And step 52, VC from the orb nav pull down menu, select orb nav gyro compass. Orb nav gyro compass send on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Copy that, VC. Check step 52. Step 53, VM, verify orb nav and gyro compass. Proceeding. Copy that. Nav and gyro compass. Copy that, VM. Check step 53. 
Step 53, decimal 1, VM, verify Orbnav heading. Orbnav heading nominal at 91, decimal 75781. Copy that, VM. Check step 53, decimal 1. And step 54, elbow. Perform an abbreviated weather brief on the weather net. Elbow moving to the weather net. It's the PM on the weather net. All stations acknowledge when polled. Elwell, RSO. Elwell. RSO. LC. LC. MD. MD. TD. TD. Okay, Elwell, proceed. High pressure still dominating our weather. No change there. Nothing significant on the radar in our vicinity. Current conditions at Wallops still excellent. Q clouds at 5,000. Visibility unrestricted. Easterly winds at 5 knots. Temperature 70. Humidity 57%. Good conditions at Kokina and Bermuda. Observe, latest observed winds, two and a half hours prior to launch, show max winds occurring in, in the about 23 knots in the lower levels of the atmosphere, increasing only to 30 knots at 95,000 feet. Our forecast weather for launch time, looking for few clouds at 5,000 feet, visibility unrestricted, east southeasterly winds at four knots, temperatures 68 degrees, humidity 60%. Coquina also looking at excellent conditions there, and Bermuda, same. Our forecast winds for launch, again, looking very light winds all the way up in the atmosphere, nothing more than 30 knots, maxing out at 35,000 feet. Probability of violating any of our weather constraints, including space weather, is zero. We have absolutely nothing that's going to stop our launch. That concludes my weather briefing. Copy all well. RSO Blast and Toxics update. This is the launch conductor on the primary content net. Step number 50 is complete. Weather brief is completed and strike that. Step number 54 is completed. Alva was completed a weather brief. Check step 54, step 55, VM verify SIGI heading. Proceeding. Copy that, sir. Siggy heading nominal at one decimal seven five seven eight. Copy that VM check step fifty five. Step fifty six, the CLC, the Siggy realignment per appendix B is not required for today's op. Check step fifty six. Step fifty seven C E. Verify launch day RBF checklist is complete. Launch day RBF checklist is complete. Copy that. Check step 57. And step 58, GSO, verify launch site cleared of all personnel. Announce pad condition red. Set warning light to red. GSO, launch site is clear and area warning light is red. Copy that, sir. Check step 58. Step 59, TD, verify island is clear and closed. Island is clear and closed. Copy that, sir. Check step 59. Step 60, PCC, apply avionics external power for the following system. Transponder on on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Required avionics on external power. Copy that, PCC. Check step 60. And OM, step 61, begin transponder interrogation at time, hour 02, minute 51, second 00, zero UTC. Transponder interrogation will begin at time hour zero two minute fifty one second zero zero UTC. 
Copy that. Check step 61. In all stations, this is a launch conductor on a primary countdown net with a status. We're currently complete through step 61, page 50 of the Laddy Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. We're currently standing by holding those steps open, and we are not working any issues. The weather brief have, has given us 0% uh, POV at launch time, and we are standing by powering on the uh, transmitters until T minus 30 minutes. This is Minotaur Launch Control at T minus 36 minutes, 21 seconds and counting. The Laddy spacecraft, as it awaits launch atop the Minotaur rocket, weighs 844 pounds and stands six and a half feet tall. The spacecraft has three lunar science instruments and one new technology demonstration, as we've heard. Once at the moon, the spacecraft will be in a very low orbit, only about 31 miles above the surface for the majority of its 100 days of science operations. However, at times, Laddie's periapsis pass, or low point of the orbit, will be at as low as just 12 miles above the lunar surface. The moon's atmosphere on the surface is comparable to the very outer fringes of Earth's atmosphere where the International Space Station orbits, but the lunar atmosphere is actually still considered a vacuum. Our countdown continues to run completely on schedule and as we've heard we have no weather violations uh, in the forecast, zero percent chance of uh, a probability of having a weather issue when we get to launch time. At T-minus 35 minutes, 10 seconds and counting, this is Minotaur Launch Control.
All stations, this is the launch conductor on the primary countdown net. Step number 62, OM, verify C-band transponder is trackable on external power. Transponder is trackable on external power. Copy that. Check step 62, PCC, power on, transmitters. Proceeding. Transmitters powered on. Check step 63, 64, PCC, evaluate transmitter bus voltage in current. Proceeding. Copy that. Transmitter bus power nominal. Copy that. Check step 64, OM verify AOS on link 40 and link 84. AOS for all links. Check step 65, FSO acknowledge SIGI data now valid for TMIG data evaluation. TMIG data now valid. Copy that. Check step 67. Step 60, strike that. Check step 66. Step 67, this is LC with a poll for readiness for FTS external power test. All stations report go. VM. VM go. BLC. BLC go. PCC. PCC go. FTS. FTS go. GSO. GSO go. And FSO. FSO go. Copy that. All stations report go. Check step 67. 68, GSO, verify FTS A and B are safe. GSO, FTS is safe. Check step 68, FSO, bring up UHF transmitters with tone 4 on. Proceeding. Copy that. LC, FSO, tone 4 on. Copy that, FSO, check step 69. FT this is Minotaur Launch Control, T minus 27 minutes, 10 seconds and counting. Right now, checks are underway of some of the range safety systems on board the vehicle. The Minotaur 5 launch vehicle is a five-stage rocket with a spin-stabilized upper stage, and it's ideally suited for launching smaller spacecraft into either geosynchronous or lunar orbit. It's been developed for the Air Force by Orbital Sciences Corporation and is a growth version of the proven four-stage Minotaur 4. The LADEE launch for NASA is the first launch of the Minotaur 5 configuration and takes advantage of a new spin-stabilized fifth stage, or upper stage. The rocket is 81 feet tall and is enclosed inside a payload fairing that is approximately 7.5 feet in diameter. Collectively, there have been a total of 23 Minotaur launches uh, launched since January of 2000, and the Minotaur has a 106% success rate since the beginning of the program. Stage 5, the upper stage with LADEE, was stacked atop the Minotaur 5 on August 24th. The orbit of LADEE is that goes around the moon during the science phase is 37.3 by 12.4 miles. The arrival date at the moon, based on a launch tonight, will be October 6th. There are 30 panels of solar cells on the spacecraft. The weight of LADEE at launch is 844.4 pounds. It is 7.7 .7 feet tall and 4 and 3 quarter feet wide. The rocket, as we see it there, weighs 197,034 pounds. That's the weight of the rocket with the spacecraft top fully fueled at liftoff. 
And as we mentioned, the azimuth of the rocket as it flies off the coast is 92.7 degrees and should be visible through much of New England with the favorable weather that we have tonight. No issues in work. The countdown procedure has been going very smoothly. Once the vehicle lifts off, spacecraft separation will occur at uh, about 23 and a half minutes after launch. And at that point, there will be an evaluation of the uh, spacecraft, and then we'll be able to confirm what we call end of mission at launch plus 30 minutes. And at that point, we hope to be able to bring you a summary on how the countdown and the flight of the Minotaur 5 has gone. At T minus 23 minutes, 53 seconds and counting, this is Minotaur launch control. In all stations, this is launch conductor on the primary count on that. We're currently standing by step number 76. We're complete through step 75, page 52 of the Laddie Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. Pick up step number 76 in approximately two minutes at T minus 20 minutes. Currently, the LV and SV and range team are working no issues. And our weather launch at launch time is currently forecast to be 0% POV. This is Minotaur Launch Control, T minus 21 minutes, 7 seconds and counting. The launch conductor who we hear is Carl Sealant from Orbital Sciences. He's been uh, counting us uh, down through this procedure since uh, the terminal countdown began at about launch minus 4 hours. All of our pad operations are complete. They've released the final weather balloon and uh, no issues there as we've heard. The uh, TDRS uh, interface testing, that's uh, all finished. And uh, we're down now to where we've got the flight termination system um, for the range on external power and coming up on a, a range readiness pole uh, from the uh, range here at Wallops. T minus 20 minutes, 15 seconds and counting. This is Benatar Launch Control. In all stations, this is Launch Conductor on the primary countdown. 
Step number 76, T minus 20 minutes and counting. BLC, verify T minus 20 minute limit checks are go. Limit checks are go. Copy that, BLC. Check step 76. This is BLC verifying the launch time. The launch time will be year 2013, hour day 250, hour 03, minute 27, second 00, UTC. Check step 77. Step 78, GNC report status of wind data. Upper level winds are go. Copy that, GNC. Check step 78. All stations were currently complete through step 78, page 52 of the LADI Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. Standing by step number 78, decimal 1. We'll pick that up approximately T minus 17 minutes. This is Minotaur Launch Control, T minus 17 minutes, 8 seconds, and counting. Our next step in the checklist will come at T minus 14 minutes. The final launch readiness poll. All stations report go. VM? VM go. BLC? BLC go. PCC? PCC go. VC? VC is go. FTS? FTS go. Orb TM. Orb TM go. GNC. GNC go. OME. OME is go. CE. CE go. SVTD. SVTD go. MM. MM go. OMM. OMM is go. GSO. GSO is go. OM. OM is go. PM. PM is go. FSO. FSO is go. RSO. RSO is go. Orbital. Orbital is go. Task. Task is go. LVSM. LVSM is go. SVPM. SVPM is go. MD. MD is go. And TD. TD is go. Copy that. All stations report go. Check step 78 decimal 1. Standing by step number 79 at T minus 14 minutes. All stations were currently complete through step 78 decimal 1 of page 53 of the LADI Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. Currently the LV and SV team are working no issues and the range is working no issues. Our weather at launch time is projected to be 0% POV. LC out. And we'll have a final report from the range here in about one minute. We'll be listening to our launch conductor 
Carl Sealant from Oral Science is conducting his final polls. And uh, here very shortly we'll hear verification that we have a complete uh, clear to launch in terms of the uh, impact limit line and the uh, launch danger area. And at that point that'll allow us to begin our final configuration of the uh, spacecraft, removing the uh, spacecraft from external power and going to internal and uh, setting up the uh, flight computer. T minus 14 minutes and 30 seconds. This is Minotaur Launch Control. All stations is the launch conductor and primary countdown at T minus 14 minutes and counting. TD, verify the hazard area, caution area, and impact limit line are clear for launch. Launch. Areas are clear. Copy that. Check step 79. And step 80, SVTD, verify spacecraft telemetry monitor is off. Spacecraft telemetry monitoring is off. Copy that, SVTD, check step 80. And all stations were currently complete through step 80, page 53, standing by step 81 at T minus 12 minutes. This is Metatar Launch Control, T minus 12 minutes, 15 seconds and counting. Once we're at T minus 2 minutes, the countdown will go on to the automatic sequencer that uh, will control the countdown the through conductor. the final two minutes of the count. Year and two zero one right now three they are entering day. the launch time into the flight computer. And that uh, confirms that uh, we will be having an on-time launch at uh, 1127. And right now they are confirming that, that, that the uh, launch sequencer is set to begin as planned at uh, launch minus two minutes. At T minus 11 minutes, 13 seconds and counting, this is Minotaur Launch Control. We apply Avionics external power for the following system. Star 48 on external power. Check step 85, PCC, evaluate power bus voltage and current. Proceeding. Copy that, PCC. External power nominal. Check step 86. And all stations were currently complete through step 86, page 54, standing by step 87 in approximately 30 seconds.
Attendance is the LC on the primary count on that. Step 87, T minus 10 minutes and counting. DLC, verify T minus 10 minute limit checks are go. Limit checks are go. Copy that. Check step 87. FTS, switch FTS A and B, internal power on. FTS, internal power on, on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Copy that, FTS, check step 88. FTS, switch FTS A and B, external power off. FTS, external power off. Check step 89. BLC, evaluate FTS A and B, voltage and current. Proceeding. FTS, internal power nominal. Check step 90. FSO, send arm command for two second duration and continue tone four. Arm on my mark, three, two, one, mark, plus one, plus two, function removed, tone four, continue. Copy that, check step 91. BLC, verify receiver arm indication. FTS arm indication verified. Check step 92. FTS, enable FTLU A and B. FTLU A and B enabled. Check step 93. BLC, verify FTLU A and B enabled. FTLU A and B enabled. Check step 94, 95. GSO, verify FTLU A and B enabled and no command destructs. GSO, FTLU A and B enabled, no command destructs. Check step 95. FTS, activate FTS arm enable. FTS arm enabled. Check step 96. FTS arm, FTS A and B, safe in arms. FTS arm on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Copy that. Check step 97. BLC, verify FTS A and B armed. FTS armed. Check step 98. FSO, verify FTS is go. FTS is go. Copy that, FSO. Check step 99. FTS is go. And step 100, SVPM, confirm spacecraft configuration checks are go. He's talking to MD. SVPM is uh, configuration checks are go for the spacecraft. Copy that, SV. SVPM, check step number 100, and all stations were currently complete through step 100, standing by step 101 at T-minus 6 minutes and 30 seconds. T-minus 7 minutes and counting. Next command will be to request final Authorization for launch at T minus six and a half minutes. In all stations, this is launch conductor on the primary count on that. Step 101, T minus six minutes, 30 seconds and counting. Requesting final authorization for launch. All stations report go. MD. MD is go for launch. TD. Clear to launch. Copy that. TD, check step 101. PCC, enable ground ordinance. Ground ordinance enabled. Check step 102, 103, ORBTM, start data archiving. Archiving started. Check step 103. And all stations were currently complete through step 103, page 57 of the LADI Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. Standing by step 104 at T minus 5 minutes.
called stations is the launch conductor on the primary count on that. T minus five minutes and counting. PCC, switch avionics internal power on. Avionics internal power on on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Copy that. PCC, switch avionics internal power on for the following system. Step 104, internal power on. Step 105, star 48 on internal power. Check step 104, 105, PCC, switch avionics external power off. External power off. Check step 106, VC, enable flight computer auto sequencer start. Auto sequencer enabled. Check step 107, PCC, arm the flight computer with the VC. Arm enable on. Flight computer armed. Arm enable off. Check step 108, VM, verify flight computer armed. Flight computer armed. Copy that, VM. Check step 109. T-minus four minutes and counting. VLC, verify T-minus four minute limit checks are go. Limit checks are go. Check, check step 110. VC, place the SIGI in free inertial navigate mode. Sending command SIGI to navigate. Check step 111. VM, verify SIGI in nav mode. SIGI in nav mode. Check step 112. VC, place orb nav in navigate mode. Orb nav to navigate. Check step 113. VM, verify orb nav in nav mode. Orb nav in nav mode. Check step 114. TD, report range green. Range green. Copy that, sir. Check step 115. And all stations were currently complete through step 115, page 58 of the LADI Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. Standing by step number 116 at T minus 2 minutes. That step at T minus two minutes will be when the launch sequencer, the computer controlling the final two minutes of countdown, will be up and running the final two minutes of the count completely under the control of the launch computer. We're about 40 seconds away from that point. T minus two minutes and 30 seconds. And all stations is launch conductor and a primary count on that. Step 116, T2 minus, T minus two minutes and counting VM, verify flight computer auto sequencer started. Auto sequencer started. Check 116, BLC, verify T, T minus two minute limit checks are go. Limit checks are go. Check 117, PCC, arm activate, ordinance arm enable. Arm enabled. Check 118, PCC, arm SNAs. And confirmation that the launch computer is now controlling. T minus 90 seconds. 120, 121 PCC enable stage 5 ODMs. ODMs enabled. Check step 121. And all stations were currently complete through step 121. Page 59 of the LADI Minotaur 5 final launch checklist. Minus one minute and counting. Orb TM start. LCR Dewey. Dewey started. Check step 122. And VM verify stage select activated. VM is go for launch. Copy that VM. Check step 123. T minus, T minus 30, 30 seconds. seconds and counting. T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 
three, two, one, zero, ignition, and liftoff of the Benatar 5 with left, pursuing a rip about moon dust and the lunar atmosphere. Altitude and flight path are nominal. Altitude is 60 kilometers. Approaching stage two burnout at 115 seconds, followed by a 20 second coast phase and a stage two separation at stage three ignition event. Stage two burnout. Separation, stage three ignition. Stage three motor pressure is nominal. Vehicle attitude and flight path are nominal. Fairing separation is confirmed. plus three minutes. Stage three motor pressure remains nominal at a maximum thrust of 70,000 pounds. We're three minutes, 17 seconds into the flight of the Minotaur 5 with Laddie. We have a map that shows where the rocket is as it flies downrange off the coast of Stage three burnout, guidance Virginia. solution confirmed or converged. Stage four ignition will occur at T plus 440 seconds. We have uh, ground contact now from the Bermuda tracking station. Bermuda will track until we acquire through the tracking and data relay satellite system. Vehicle avionics and power systems are nominal. T plus four minutes. Vehicle avionics and power systems are nominal. Minotaur 5 is 900 kilometers downrange at an altitude of 205 kilometers, traveling to a speed of 6 kilometers per second. Flight termination system is disabled as planned.
Wallops uh, is still tracking. Vehicle attitude is nominal. And uh, Bermuda has acquired. Turning off the flight uh, termination system means the launch vehicle is on track, on course. Sorry. Uh, stage four ignition will occur in approximately 125 seconds. Vehicle avionics and power are all nominal. Transmitter is powered on. T plus six minutes. Right now we're tracking through Bermuda. We're going to be losing our signal at Wallops here in about 45 seconds. And uh, Tedris has acquired. Vehicle attitude is nominal. Vehicle avionics and power systems are all nominal. The launch vehicle is now 1,700 kilometers downrange at an altitude of 260 kilometers. Travel at a speed of 5.9 kilometers per second. Orb nav reinitialized. T plus seven minutes. Stage four TVC battery activation has been initiated. Battery power is nominal. Stage three separation confirmed. Stage four ignition confirmed. Stage four motor pressure is nominal. Vehicle attitude is nominal. T plus eight minutes, stage four motor pressure nominal at a maximum thrust of 17,400 pounds. The launch vehicle is now 2,200 miles kilometers downrange at an altitude of 270 kilometers, traveling at a speed of 6.8 kilometers per second. For burnout, predicted orbit is nominal. T plus nine minutes. Okay, we're nine minutes into the flight, and at this point we're beginning an eight-minute coast phase before we have the um, stage five ignition. In 10 seconds. And we have oriented now for stage five ignition. Vehicle attitude is nominal. And the vehicle attitude uh, completely nominal, on course, on track. And we've just lost uh, our tracking from Bermuda. We are now on the tracking of data relay satellite. Vehicle avionics and power systems are nominal. T plus 10 minutes.
Next event will be the stage four separation that occurs 14 minutes 30 seconds into the flight and then approximately another minute Eager later powered off. We'll be powered the back on in uh, 170 seconds. fifth stage will spin up. The fifth stage ignition doesn't occur until T plus 11 minutes. 17 minutes into the flight. We're right now 11 minutes into the flight of the Minotaur 5 with Laddie. The launch vehicle is now 3,600 kilometers downrange at an altitude of 240 kilometers, traveling at a speed of 7.5 kilometers per second. T plus 12 minutes. plus 13 minutes. Next event will be the stage four separation at 14 minutes 30 seconds into flight. Stage five will spin up at the launch plus 15 minutes 42 seconds. After that occurs there will be about a minute and a half and then stage five will ignite. 13 minutes, 30 seconds into the flight of the Minotaur 5. Teeter's transmitter is powered on, telemetry reacquired, all systems are nominal. Teeter's supplying data as it approaches the coast of Africa. Vehicle attitude and flight path are nominal. T plus 14 minutes. Stage four separation confirmed. Orb nav reinitialized. Orient for stage five spin. T plus 15 minutes. Student flight path are nominal.
Martin Motors initiated. T plus 16 minutes, stage five, spinning at a one revolution per second. It will continue to spin during stage five burn. The stage five ignition is expected in approximately 50 seconds. I have confirmation that spin up has occurred, that is underway. We're at 16 minutes, 30 seconds into flight, stage five ignition in 30 seconds. T plus 17 minutes. T plus 18 minutes. Stage five is now 7,000 miles downrange at an altitude of 200 kilometers, traveling at a speed of 10.5 kilometers per second. T plus 19 minutes. plus 20 minutes.
T plus 21 minutes. T spin will occur in approximately 40 seconds. plus 22 minutes. D-spin has been initiated. Zero. Orbital parameters are within requirements. Vehicle attitude and flight path are nominal. Five avionics and power systems are all nominal. T plus twenty three minutes. Stage five is currently holding attitude for spacecraft deployment. Body separation is confirmed. Vehicle attitudes and rates at payload separation appear nominal. Orbit is nominal with a C3 of 2.74 kilometers squared per second squared, a perigee of 197 kilometers, an inclination of 37.63 degrees, and an argument of perigee of 155 degrees. Godspeed on your journey to the moon, laddie. T plus 24 minutes. to continue teachers pointing. T plus 25 minutes. We've had confirmation of spacecraft separation. The spacecraft is in uh, good health and a good orbit at this point. And uh, all the uh, data coming back is that we've had a nominal spacecraft separation of Laddie from the Minotaur 5 rocket. T plus 26 minutes. The 
orbit appears to be nominal from the initial data we got. Event has been initiated. So at this point, we will be standing by for our launch services manager to give us a status on uh, what he's seen in the uh, flight data and uh, how the countdown went. Peter's transmitter's off. LOS is confirmed. And, and we've now had loss of signal through Tedris. That brings to a conclusion the Minotaur 5 mission for Laddie. We'll stand by now for some status and uh, some comments from the Wallops Center Director, Bill Rebell. But at this point, we are 27 minutes and 30 seconds into the flight of land. LC, this is OM on channel 6. Go ahead, OM. Can you confirm your readiness to release generator power configuration? Uh, we are ready. Yes, you may. Copy that, LC.
This is Metatar Launch Control. We're now 32 minutes, 15 seconds into the flight of Laddie, which has now successfully separated for the Metatar 5 rocket. We have confirmation from the NASA Ames Laddie Control Center that they have received a signal from Laddie and that it uh, appears to be in good health. It's uh, in the correct orbit and has phoned home. We're awaiting some uh, status on how the flight of the Minotaur actually went from our launch services uh, program manager, Doug Voss, who should be joining us shortly. In the meantime, the uh, countdown and launch team is being released. They're having a short debriefing on their consoles before they uh, actually leave their stations. But their job is finished at this point, and all of the rain support here at Wallops has been released. We're at now 33 minutes, 40 seconds into flight. This is Minotaur Launch Control, 36 minutes, 19 seconds now into the flight with the now Laddie spacecraft on its own and what appears to be a, a successful mission underway. We're being joined now here by Doug Voss. He is the Launch Services Project Manager here at NASA Wallops for the Laddie mission. And uh, Doug would like to, uh, first of all, maybe get some comments from you about how you felt the countdown went? The countdown overall, I felt, went very well. It was a very smooth countdown. Uh, we'd rehearsed it three times, uh, two green cards, simulation team training events, as well as a uh, mission dress. So all that practice paid off, and it, it went very well. We actually got ahead of count a couple of times in terms of having extra time, so that was, that was very good. 
uh, to have a little bit of margin in case some problems cropped up. But we really didn't have very many problems, if any, really, of any significance throughout the count. So it was it was nearly picture perfect. And it appears we launched like right on the money. Right. We first night, uh, first minute of the first window. We'll talk some about uh, the flight. We were listening to some of the uh, flight events being called by Orbital. And uh, what was your uh, impression as you heard these uh, events being called and saw some of the data coming in about how the flight of the Minotaur went? Sure, we were tracking those events very closely. We had um, our, our plus count event lists in front of us, and we're, we're tracking all of the, uh, not just the range systems as they came in and acquired the vehicle and, and, and tracked the vehicle, but also the key events on the launch vehicle. And so uh, uh, and they were going very well in terms of nominal uh, events throughout most of the flight. So it was um, it was exciting time. The plus count is always a very exciting time, keeping up with the uh, the events as it goes through the flight. Maybe a little insight on why there appeared to be a period of time where we didn't hear some uh, event calls coming in and and uh, reporting some status around around fifth stage. Right. This mission was was fairly unique. We didn't have ground telemetry and radar track throughout the entire flight. So uh, during the fifth stage portion and part of the fourth stage portion, we relied on the TDRS transmitter. That was the, uh, the transmitter that was installed on that uh, fifth stage to communicate with the TDRS network, the uh, tracking data relay satellite network. And uh, during the fifth stage spin events, uh, the fifth stage spinning at approximately um, one time a second, one hertz. So we expected some dropouts in data. And uh, during that time frame, we didn't get some calls on, on certain stage five events that, that had us pretty concerned, but um, uh, later events confirmed that uh, the system was operating nominally, at least for those events. And when we heard uh, spacecraft separation and, and Laddie coming alive, uh, we knew we uh, were, in, were in good good standing then. Well, Doug, thanks very much. And it looks like uh, we've had a very successful countdown, a successful launch, and uh, now we have a happy spacecraft on the way to the moon. Right. It's 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 quite a great ending uh, to what's been a fantastic mission, a very unique mission, and I'm real honored to be a part of it. Doug, thanks very much. Thank you. And we're now at uh, 39 minutes, 32 seconds into the flight with Laddie now on its own. This is Minotaur Launch Control. LC, this is OMM on Countdown Net Channel 6. LC, OMM Channel 6. We're looking at the 
control room here at uh, Wallops Island where the uh, launch team has been monitoring the countdown and the flight and uh, with a successful launch the center director here at uh, Wallops Bill Rebell is going to be making some congratulatory remarks to the uh, launch team and the range team here in the control room and uh, we're sort of uh, standing by for that he'll uh, be doing that here momentarily and uh, as soon as uh, Bill is uh, ready to make remarks we will begin putting that uh, on the air as it happens. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? TC, uh, LC, this is OMM, Channel 6. LC, OMM, Channel 6. Go ahead. Receipt of state vector confirmed. We're resending it uh, and make sure that the format's clear. But I've talked to SVPM, so I can I can give you a, a confirmation on step 12. Copy that. Thank you very much and congratulations, Mr. Hunley. You too, Carl. Copy that. LC out.
Hey, could I have everybody's attention? Just wanted to say, I think congratulations are in order all the way around. Uh, spectacular night tonight for Orbital Sciences, Air Force, Ames, Headquarters, Wallops. Who else we got? Kennedy? Goddard? No, I wasn't going to forget Goddard. We're part of Goddard. I know there'd be a lot of celebrations going on, um, but I want to say thanks to whoever handed me the Laddie cigar. I think that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, I know that I know that uh, champagne will be flowing, but I, I just want to say again, kind of on behalf of Wallops, thank you very much. It, it, it was a very special night for all of us here, and uh, I know it is for for well, probably all of you as well. So again, th thanks a lot, and congratulations to everyone here.